This program illustrates the fundamental electrical systems of the automobile. If you understand the physics of electricity, it will be easy to understand most autoelectrics. Since the first automobiles, the electrical system has evolved along with our attitude to the car. Accessories and instrumentation have increased, but much of the hardware has become smaller and more efficient due to solid state electronics. The changes in individual components may have been dramatic, yet the basic electrical system has remained unchanged. It still relies on a starter motor for turning the engine over, an ignition system to ignite the fuel, a charging system to run power equipment and restore a chemical energy reserve, the battery. The starter is a low-speed, high-torque DC electric motor. It includes an electromagnet called a solenoid that pushes the pinion gear out to mesh with the flywheel. The starter motor then turns the engine over. It must have enough torque to overcome engine compression and then be able to disengage when the engine fires. What we're going to look at is the operation of the shift lever mechanism to throw the pinion into mesh with the ring gear. And this is actuated by the solenoid. If we actuate the, the solenoid, we can see the pinion move out. Now this pinion would move into mesh with the ring gear. This thrusting of the pinion into mesh is actuated by a lever inside here you can see it's pulled in by the magnetic action of the solenoid and the solenoid is a pure electromagnetic device The solenoid's second function is to switch on the starter motor. Once the lever has engaged the pinion, it then closes the circuit. The starter motor must transfer energy very quickly, that is, it has to be high powered. Power is the rate of doing work. The motor achieves high power by employing thick coils of wire to magnetise a soft iron carcass and produce the main magnetic field. Power equals volts multiplied by current. If you double the current or the voltage, then the power doubles. But in a car, the voltage is fixed, so maximum current through thick, low-resistance coils produces maximum power. Rotating within this set of field coils is a series of conductors called an armature. Electrons flow from the field coils through these bare copper bars of the commutator and into the rotating armature. A pair of brushes contacting the commutator allow electrons to flow through each conductor in turn. The moving electrons set up a second magnetic field which interacts with the first one. This causes the armature to turn. We can see how the magnetic field of the armature conductors causes the main magnetic field to distort. Here we have a wound field coil 
wound onto a soft core um, pole shoe connected to a soft iron core or yoke which forms the magnetic path from one uh, field coil to the next field coil. <clears throat> Rotating inside the field coils we have a set of conductors. These conductors carry the current through them. That current is supplied through a set of brushes. Here you can see one brush running on inside a commutator. As you can see inside here the commutator. A segmented commutator. This connects the armature conductors in series with the field coils. The armature conductors are forced to rotate as the resultant magnetic field is stronger on one side and weaker on the other side of the conductors. To understand in detail how this rotation is caused, we need to understand a little more electromagnetism. When electrons flow in a conductor, they produce a magnetic field which acts at right angles to the direction of electron flow. We can see the movement caused by interacting magnetic fields at this compass needle. The direction in which these lines of force circle a conductor can be found by pointing the thumb of the left hand in the direction of electron flow. Then the fingers curl with the lines of force. In our diagrams, flow into the wire is shown by a cross, a symbol for the flights or tail feathers of an arrow. Electron flow out of a wire is shown as a dot, the point of an arrow heading out. We can determine the direction of rotation of a direct current motor by following the main magnetic field from north to south and deciding whether the fields add to each other above or below the armature conductors. Use the left hand rule to work out which way this rotor will turn. Stop the tape if you need more than 15 seconds. First, work out which way the lines of force circle the conductors. Then, following the main field from north to south, on the right, the fields add to each other above, and on the left, they add to each other below. And so the armature would rotate clockwise. The internal combustion engine burns a mixture of fuel and air under pressure. The petrol vapour is ignited by a high energy spark. The spark is the result of a surge of high voltage produced through making and breaking a low voltage in one coil of wire which induces a high voltage in a second interwound coil. The two coils are housed in one container and together with the making and breaking device, a fast acting mechanically activated switch called points, and a rotating distribution terminal, they make up the Kettering ignition system. Kettering filed a patent for a battery ignition system in 1908 and the same basic method has been used in automobile engines for almost 80 years.
Ignition of the air-fuel mixture occurs every second rise of each piston in a four-stroke engine. The whole system is made viable by the ignition coil, which makes use of electromagnetic induction. The opening and closing of points continually changes the velocity of electrons moving in the primary coil. This induces a primary coil voltage and a changing magnetic field, which in turn induces electron movement in the secondary coil. The secondary winding is subjected to the same magnetic field changes as the primary and has the same induced voltage per turn. So the secondary is made with tens of thousands of turns of fine wire, with the result that 12 volts at the battery is stepped up to 300 in the primary and then 20,000 volts at the spark plug. The points, which mechanically switched the high voltage, were the first to change with solid state electronics because they wore out and bounced, causing misfiring. Transistorized amplification of the contacts saw them evolve into a triggering device for an electronic circuit. In the latest vehicles, the distributor has been replaced by a computer which senses the crankshaft rotation and controls the input to two induction coils. This system charges the battery and supplies all the electricity needed by various circuits while the engine is running. The energy is transferred from the crankshaft to an alternator or generator by a rubber belt. Electrons will move along a wire when a magnetic field changes around them. The electromotive force E, or the voltage pushing the electron, will be increased if the magnetic field strength, or flux density B, is increased, or the velocity of the conductor through the field increases, or if the length of the winding L is increased. In an alternator, a magnetic field is rotated within a set of stationary conductors, and in a generator, a set of conductors are rotated within a magnetic field. Both machines produce alternating current which cannot be directly used to charge a battery. In the first cars, generators or dynamos as they were called were used for charging because it was fairly easy to design a commutator so that electrons flowed from the armature in one direction. A cutout switch was needed when the engine was stopped to prevent burnout because the design is the same as an electric motor and if electrons were not being pushed into the battery, the battery would push electrons back through the generator. The DC dynamo is rapidly becoming obsolete. As cars evolved, solid state silicon rectifiers became available, making the alternator more efficient. The output of an alternator is AC, and over time there is no net electron flow, no battery charging. If we stop the electron flow in one direction, the output would be pulsed but usable. This is called half-wave rectification, and it is equivalent to a continuous straight-line direct current of 37% of the peak value. Diodes allow electrons to flow in one direction only. Diodes in a bridge like this allow the whole output signal to be used. Here we have slowed the reversing output of an alternator to watch the flow at the battery. This is called full wave rectification 
and it is equivalent to continuous DC of 63% of the peak value. In most car alternators, the AC output goes to a rectification bank of diodes producing three-phase full-wave rectified output, which is a close approximation to direct current. The two devices used for the vehicle charging system can be either a generator or an alternator. Now the generator consists of a set of wound field coils and an armature. The armature is constructed of an iron core and wound onto the iron core are a set of copper conductors connected to the external circuit via a commutator and a set of brushes. Now if we turn that we can see the armature rotating inside the field coils. Now with the alternator it's a much more efficient machine. Here, what we have with the alternator is the electromagnetic field rotating inside the armature conductors. The armature conductors there. So the armature conductors are stationary and it is the electromagnetic field that rotates. And we can see it rotating here. There is no need for a commutator. We have a set of slip rings that connect the electromagnetic circuit to the external circuit for energising this. Both machines produce alternating current. The generator employs the commutator to switch AC to DC. The alternator employs electronic circuitry to switch the AC to DC for battery charging. Our basic equation tells us that the electromotive force or voltage is directly proportional to the velocity of the conductors. As the engine speed varies, voltage must somehow be kept constant. Automotive charging systems require some form of voltage regulation. The uh, charging unit, will uh, its voltage output will depend upon the RPM of the motor. As RPM goes up, so does the voltage. So a voltage regulator is employed to control that output. It's a voltage governor. There are several types. Early types were vibrating contact types like this one here that has a vibrating contact that controls the field current. Now, these are exactly the same. The voltage regulator has a vibrating contact to control field current and that controls the output from the generator or alternator. Now this one here looks very much the same. Again it is a vibrating contact. The only difference with this, with this one is, is that it is from an alternator. The last three units here, these are solid state devices. Notice that they're very small and they employ solid state circuitry to control the field current. The battery is an energy reserve. Its main job is to power the starter motor. It also provides energy when the engine is not operating. Engines are hard to turn over, as anyone who has hand cranked a car will know. Not only do we need to do work quickly, we may need to crank for some time. This is why the capacity of a battery to do work is measured in amp hours. A 36 amp hour battery would be capable of delivering 3.6 amps for 10 hours. This electrical energy is stored in chemical form. Nearly all vehicles use a lead acid cell type battery with six 2 volt cells connected in series to give 12 volts. The battery is recharged by reversing the chemical reaction which takes place between an acid solution and lead electrode plates. Because the lead plates have a large surface area, the 12-volt car battery 
has low internal resistance and can deliver a heavy starter current. Modern car engines are managed by computer. The ignition, fuel injection, charging system and exhaust emissions are monitored, compared and adjusted by a microprocessor. Emission control standards have been the catalyst for incorporating electronic control in cars. The latest test equipment for the whole engine management system is contained within a briefcase which plugs directly into the computer and the car's wiring harness. The computer is housed in an aluminium box and consists of printed circuit boards which support and connect the microchips and integrated circuitry. The test machine monitors the data going to the car's computer and the output signals that it generates. The test machine can electronically substitute for the car's computer and or any faulty component. So a car broken down on the road due to a fault in its computer, can theoretically be driven back to a garage using the test equipment. In a garage, the individual components, voltages and signals can be analysed in detail using an oscilloscope. Computerised testing is quick and reduces the risk of damage to expensive components. But if all this looks and sounds like an inaccessible world of specialists, or if your car is a few years old, then don't be downhearted. An understanding of electricity greatly simplifies the tools you need. Three fundamental pieces of test equipment that we use in the automotive industry are, one, a test light. In this case, an LED test light, which when we connect it across to the battery, will show us whether we have a, uh, a positive or not, or a voltage. And there when we see the LED come on, we know we have a voltage. With this particular device, if I have it connected the wrong way round, it will not work. So we, this is what we call polarity conscious. It will only work when connected in the correct order. Now that's the most fundamental tool. A slightly more sophisticated one is the digital meter, digital voltmeter. Here we have it selected to voltage and we select it to our particular range. In this case it's a 12 volt battery, we have it selected to 20 volts. If I connect this across here we should see a voltage reading on the meter. Here we can see 12.89 volts, almost 13 volts. Now this meter can be also used to test resistance and also current up to 10 amps. Now in terms of the ignition system, to find out if we have spark we can use what we call a spark plug tester. We connect this to the spark plug lead, ground the other end to the engine and if we have a spark jumping across this gap we know our coil is producing a high enough spark to ignite the fair fuel mixture in the cylinder. So three very simple fundamental tools used by automotive electricians. Oh, I never... After all the trouble, we had to be in front of the